Well, thank you, Professor Donald, for joining me in this, the first uh, Productive Consciousness uh, podcast, where we explore issues about uh, consciousness, human nature, and uh, and uh, pr productiveness, let's just say. Um, so uh, you're Professor Emeritus at Queen's, and are you still affiliated with uh, Chase Western University? Chase Western, we uh, know amicably ended that relationship a while ago, but I've still, still I pointed at Queen's, yes. Okay, okay, okay. So um, uh, I was wondering how you got interested in the whole business of uh, consciousness. Well, I've been interested in that since I was a teenager. I don't know why. Um, I was always... Uh, maybe a bit of a mystic. I, I, I write a little mm -hmm. poetry, I, um, and I'm uh, very interested in different uh, approaches to the whole question of consciousness. Uh, this has been a passion of mine since I was young. So you're well ahead of your time, because uh, I think one of the people who really popularized the topic in psychology was um, Bernard Barr's his book appeared in 1988. So oh, that's much later. Yes, that's that's I, I, Barr's was I think a, an important uh, figure, and I, I featured his theory quite prominently in my uh, my second book um, because that Barr's and Newman to me is the only really serious physiological time. I, I I'm less you know. Optimistic about Crick and Koch, but, but certainly Bars and Newman were the standard for me, definitely. Yes, yeah, they raised the bar pretty high with the quite quite the volume there. Um, so stepping back more generally, so I was wondering what aspects of your um, of your family culture, because you talk a lot about culture in your in your um, in your in your books on uh, on consciousness and your papers on consciousness. What about your your microculture, your family culture? How did that? Well, my, um, it's, it's how, an interesting thing. My family it was not an academic family. My father was uh, the CEO of an insurance company. <laughs> so oh, okay. The, about as far from academia as you can get. Um, but he was a very when he was in school, he was a very good student. But he. He went in a different direction back in Victorian times, you know, back in something like 1910 or 1920, oh. he, for reasons within the family, he, he went into business. Um, but some predecessors had gone to McGill and gone to Loyola and had, you know, had experiences. But my my real family, my academic family, were the Jesuits. Oh, I studied right. with the Jesuits. And they are... It, of course, uh, unfortunately, they've never been able to replenish their ranks, and they've kind of diminished. But the college that I went to has disappeared. It was a private uh, college run by the Jesuits. But uh, they are uh, very interested in such things and um, very focused on the individual, the nature of the individual. And uh, the education I received was uh, not that different from the classical education prior to the Second World War, you know, I think it was very broad and it aimed at very fundamental, very broad questions. And uh, I, that's what caught my interest. And of course, lots of students went through that same program and <laughs> they just uh, did not pick up on that, they weren't really interested, but, but I was from day one and especially in medieval philosophy and Yes, I had a German philosophy professor who was very good in that period, and uh, I uh, I kept that. You know, when I went to graduate school at McGill, I was uh, initially in philosophy rather than psychology, but I found philosophy oh. at that point, especially analytic philosophy, incredibly stale. Uh, I didn't find it interesting at all. Had I run into someone like Charles Taylor at that time, who we got to know later on, and we get along very well, but at that time, I might have gone and continued in philosophy, but I was not interested in analytic philosophy at all. So I, I and at that time, McGill was probably the best place in the world for uh, biological psychology, that kind of thing. Uh, so it was, you know, not a difficult decision to make. I, I went in that direction. Um, Hans Selye was at the University of Montreal. Did you attend any of his lectures, or did he influence you at all? Selye. Uh, <clears throat> well, I was not, I mean, I, I certainly was a, an icon at that time, a very stylish character, a very strong personality. 
but you know, the general adaptation syndrome was not my primary interest. It was very different kind of focus. So I uh, and I had made a very uh, deliberate decision in my career early on that I did not want to land in a medical school, even though I was offered some very good jobs in, in medical schools at different points. And I did start my first my postdoc in that kind of context. It simply firmed my resolve. I was going to get back oh. into arts and science. And I wanted that breadth, that freedom to go in any direction. And the medical school environment is a highly specialized environment in which you, you never get out of your box. If you specialize in some fine, uh, detailed, some region of, let's say, um, microbiology, that's where you are. I mean, you can't move from there. It, it's too narrow. You could say, well, some people think their way out of it. Yes, but not very many. <laughs> it's Right, it's not right. Right, especially well, the kind, you know, the kind of broad approach I took. You, you're better off in arts and science, or in some completely different, uh, as you know very well, direction. Right, right, and yet uh, you still had a neuroscience. Uh, you still went into neuroscience, which is, um, uh, well, yes. I guess, you could connected. Yes, in in my view, uh, it's like. Uh, Learning the language of the enemy in some degrees. I mean, I was very influenced by people like Marshall McLuhan and, and Northrop Frye when I was young, and I was very passionate about the the human humanization of of science. And uh, I know that psychology at that time was one of the, it, in my view, one of the dehumanizing influences for the most part. Uh, yes. Experimental psychology and so, but I had to learn it because uh, it, and it obviously has had, I think, a bigger impact on the 20th and 21st century than, than physics. I mean, physics came up with the bomb and a lot of very good things as well, but uh, nothing compares to the exportation of behaviorism into business schools <laughs> for impact because it has created this global corporate culture, which is in, by far the most controlling surveillance-based culture that's ever existed, and it's extraordinarily dangerous. So my initial venture into psychology was with that attitude. <clears throat> that changed with time because I I, I started to see the virtues of, of, of that behavioristic kind of approach. But, uh, I always retained a certain reservation and when I finally got free to write uh, what I really wanted to write in the 40s, uh, and I, I was determined to finish that first book before I was 50, um, I, uh, you know, I reverted to my real, real perspective, it was just a humanization perspective, humanize everything, make man the, the measure of everything. And get yes. rid of this damn neuro, neoliberal nonsense that has perverted our, our society globally. Right. And you were, um, so you saw the cognitive revolution happen and you uh, became, I think you called yourself a cognitive scientist at some point, but I think yeah. later you uh, um, you had criticisms of cognitive science. So how did that all evolve? Well, I, I don't think... I, you know, there are great things in cognitive science, and some of it is inevitable. I mean, that's one thing about the science. When something clicks, you can see it, and it's inevitable because it's true. <laughs> and certain aspects of cognitive science caught on. And I think the result of uh, a theory, something like Bars and Newman's theory, is, is a validation of that general approach to the mind. But of course, I don't think even Barnes and Newman would claim that they had explained everything about the mind at all. Uh, but I think that that approach is, is essential. And so, in many ways, I am on board with their approach, even though I I, I have a far different and broader approach. I think, but but certainly, if you want to stick with the experimental data, theirs is the best theory around by far. I think. 
Okay. Sorry, when you say theirs, are you referring to quantum science in general or, or Bars's theory? You jumped into Bars's theory. I don't completely understand what you... What Sorry, you uh, said theirs is the best, going back to what the theory, theirs is the best theory or approach. Do you mean well, the cognitive science? Kind of, of that kind of approach. In other words, if you want to restrict yourself to experimental evidence and certain types of, of approaches that came out of the cognitive revolution, I think Mars and Human has a very valid approach. It's a structural approach, and it is a structural in the sense of looking both at the physical structure and at the mental architecture that overlays the whole thing. Uh, they're the only ones that do that effectively, in my view. <clears throat> I, I guess you could argue that Crick and Cox had a stab at it, but there was too there was too much preaching going on there. I mean. Uh, too much stance taking and so on. Uh, this has to be an empirical effort and you have to be will, willing to look at any kind of evidence including subjective evidence yes which is absolutely crucial um, i've recently written a few things about inner subjectivity and the domain of inner subjectivity which is the main thing that human beings do yes <laughs> that, that that's what the mind is for so how can you restrict yourself to some called objective data that's ridiculous Anyway, that's 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 how I that's the, the approach I take, and I think that and similarly the people with the mysterious, you know, starting with David Chalmers, are just playing games. I mean, yes, it's very mysterious and very uh, the hard problem is seemingly intractable. I said that in sort of the entry level of my second book. Uh, of course, we, we don't know. Anything about how a thing like a neuron could generate consciousness. I mean, it's it's obvious, and we have the slightest idea. It's a it's a slimy little beast that seems to have absolutely no intelligence of any kind. So <laughs> why you know why would you uh, think that uh, the brain, which is made up of neurons and, and glia, uh, could somehow magically convert that into a form of thought? We don't know and. I'm not sure we ever will know, but that's irrelevant to developing a theory because, for example, the field of genetics, which has made tremendous progress during my lifetime, almost from zero to 100, uh, is uh, unable to explain anything with genes. You don't have to, to change, to be able to intervene in the process, to create clones, to you know, uh, just... Uh, altered the genome, which is a very dangerous thing to do, but the power is there. We don't have to, folks, understand the relationship between genes and, and, the, and the phenome and the fund and, and the you know, release of all those genes and expression of all those genes in order to have a theory. So I, I, I'm not in, in constructing the kind of theory I was. I was thinking with what was possible in my view. The fact that we can't solve the hard, hard problem is completely irrelevant, a complete waste of time. But that's it was my luck to, to publish my book just as the, the whole field of the, the New York gang anyway moved in that direction. They were just running around in circles saying, whoa, what a mysterious yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What's the point? <laughs> it's well, you're not, you're not, not, you're also not alone in, in, um, in uh in in not focusing on the supposedly hard problem yeah it's not a, not that hard a problem really <laughs> it's when you come down to it if you don't know anything it's very simple you, you move into an area where you can know something right so uh maybe this brings us to uh, questions about philosophy of science so mm -hmm. um i mean there's a general um uh, research method that you just provided there, which is that if something seems conceptually intractable, then let's put that aside, let the philosophers worry about it, and let's get on, we as scientists, with uh, what we, uh, trying to understand what we can understand. So uh, how would you describe your your general philosophy of science? Do you think, as a philosopher of science, did it inspire the way you did your your um, uh, you're theorizing about, or the way you do your theorizing about about well, consciousness. That's, that's an interesting question. Another very general question. Yes, yes. And and but but nevertheless, uh, you know, the effort that I've made 
to move from, let's say, to understand the transition from a Miocene ape to a modern human mind, um, there's a number of things that are implicit in this. And one of them is, is that I'm examining the infrastructure that is necessary before you can even have philosophy. In other mm. words, uh, you can't even ask the question, how did we arrive at a point where we could ask such questions or have such curiosities? Um, so this is very fundamental stuff. I don't know that uh, the philosophers, the majority of them, in any case, are <laughs> aware of that that perspective. Uh, it, it's it, evolution is uh, such a fundamental thing that uh, a lot of philosophy doesn't get at it because it assumes that we've already evolved, that we have literate cultures, etc. <clears throat> it just takes that for granted as the sea it swims in. But in fact, I'm looking at the sea and I'm saying, how do we become capable of, of swimming in it? And uh, uh, in a sense, there's an implicit epistemology in my entire theory. It, it does suggest how uh, not only how we became able to think, but how the domains of thought and representation came into existence yeah so it's very fundamental stuff okay but, and i'm sure we're gonna unpack that as we uh as we move yeah. forward in this conversation <clears throat> go ahead Merlin. no it's all right that, that's all i had to say okay so um you set aside the supposedly hard problems and then there's people who set aside consciousness altogether um and you respond to some of them you call them the hardliners in your uh in the mind so rare and uh um how so maybe you could share with uh, the listeners how you characterize the hardliners with respect to consciousness and how you how you respond to them well uh, the hard line is uh, essentially that consciousness doesn't matter that we're not re really conscious of anything and that consciousness doesn't do anything that voluntary action and free will don't exist etc uh dan dennis for example i mean it, it, it's good old-fashioned determinism in fact in the religious context or theological context predestination predestinarian stuff and that kind of thought has been common for, for, you know since the greeks really i mean there <clears throat> there is a branch of thought uh, that is predestinarian in its concept everything is predetermined uh, and that was you know essentially a religious position for a very long time and the, then they shifted they, they claimed that the, the raw the if you will the foundation of determinism now comes from physics you know, from the inevitableness of causality as observed in physical and chemical reactions etc and then they generalize and say well uh, that's true in biology uh, I don't think that is true, uh, and especially it's not true as you increase the level of complexity in nervous systems, uh, because the very thing they do is resolve uncertainty in, in, in a variety of ways. So um, they, the physical universe is, is absolutely an environment of certainty and causality determinism, et cetera, that, that approach works. But it's based on sheer assumptions, if you will, I would say religious beliefs in the case of, uh, of the general scientific attitude adopted in biology and psychology. Um, I think uh, psychology uh, does not include enough philosophers in, in the education of psychologists. Most of them have only read Karl Popper or perhaps Thomas Nagel, and they don't they don't appreciate the, the richness of that environment, let alone pay any attention to all the theological debates, which are you know would be a, a major part of philosophy, whether they like it or not. Okay, so uh, I guess it would be too early to ask how we could falsify your theory because I haven't given you a chance to um, uh, to describe your theory. 
Um, so maybe we can get into uh, some of that. I, I think there's maybe two major. I can, uh, I can insert one thing at the beginning about okay. the presentation. You want to falsify my theory? Prove it wrong. <laughs> Any aspect of it, you know, that's that simple. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So it's open to criticism, basically. So it's open to logical criticism in principle. It's open to empirical criticism. Yes, absolutely. I mean, every aspect of it is, is open. But it, it, it's not easy to disprove it. And the reason is, is that I, I adopted, I've written a little paper, I don't know if you've read it, called, um, it, it's a, about focusing on the big facts in various disciplines. Um, and um, what you have to do is, if you take very stable findings, and they they do exist even in psychology and, and archaeology and biology and so on, um, you take very stable facts and but that come from very distant places, and be very careful not to accept any fact that contradicts another stable fact in an, in a, another field. And since people don't read it outside their fields, very often mm. they violate that, especially psychologists. And so, so then, uh, if you're proposing something that assumes, for example, that language is generated by some special brain structure that is specialized for language, and then uh, you look at research, let's say in linguistics or um, neuro-linguistic philosophy, uh, psychology, feel like that, that contradicts that finding, then you, you have to dismiss it. You cannot pursue a theory that assumes that. Uh, so eliminate anything that contradicts one of your big stable facts. That's what I did initially in, a, in several fields, starting especially with neuropsychology because I I had been teaching the language of the brain for a long time, and so I was very familiar with it. And uh, I was also a research clinician in that field in my oh. very first job at the ASIS in the US. And so you could take, let's say, Wernicke's model or uh, any number of models that came out of the late 19th century and uh, of, of the phasia and the graphia and uh, examine it empirically and see where it led, you know, and that's where I started. And then I, I realized that language was not mathematically modelable. It, it did not lend itself to those kinds of quantitative uh, models for a variety of reasons. And uh, so I, I read a lot of that. I was also a classically trained humanistic scholar, so I was very aware of literature and so on. So I, I always had a, a, a distant perspective on neuropsychology, even though I was so familiar with it. I taught it. That's where I started. And, and initially, it, it was a module hunt. Initially, I was looking for the brain module structure under underlying language everybody was looking for. It. Somehow mm -hmm. that could explain why we were so different from apes, even, even though we were genetically not far away. And um, when you realize that the genetic distance is so short, the distance between you and and the Miocene ape was no greater than between a chimpanzee and the Miocene ape, or a gorilla and a chimpanzee. You know? In other words, why is it that we're so dramatically different? You would expect to find almost a, a different brain, you know, or a completely different set of structures. So it started off that way. That was, that was yeah. When I started to write that book, it was in the early 80s, I guess. I was busy running a lab and doing something quite different. But that, that's how it built. And so I finished it in late 89, early 90. And it was published in '91, and right. um, but I went through a lot. At one point, I went to London. I was alone for three or four months, and that's what dawned on me that the two things missing 
you know, first of all, there was no language module, and the second thing was um, that uh, there, there was a pneumatic adaptation for skill that set up the whole architecture. And then there was this externalization of memory in exagrams that was supplementary architecture, even though it was not biological. And then the value of the architectural approach becomes obvious. But uh, I needed those two insight, insights to get there. And then meanwhile, I, I had spent some time in Boston uh, studying Helen Keller, and it, it became obvious that uh, to a person who was deaf and blind, lived in a silent, dark world, uh, she nevertheless wrote 14 books, <laughs> you know, so how did that happen? And what is a word to somebody who lives in darkness and silence? And it was largely tactile and, uh, you know, locomotor in her case, but it, it became obvious that looking for a traditional kind of uh, language module was a futile direction. Of course, right. I had the, the good fortune to propose that idea when Chomsky was dominated <laughs> the linguistics departments, but right. um, that didn't make me too many friends. But <laughs> that's you know, you have to do what you have to do. Yes, yes. So um, I, I, I recall that you said you're classically trained, so you would have been uh, very familiar with uh, uh, Aristotle's and uh, oh, Thomas yes. Aquinas. Aquinas is uh, oh yes <laughs> attempts to uh, explain. Uh, what uh, Mortimer Adler called in his book, um, The Difference of Man and the Difference It Makes. I don't know if you've come across that book. Uh, but I, I don't, not that particular one, although I, I'm aware, you know, 60 years ago reading Mortimer Adler. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And it was quite the, quite the Aristotelian. Anyway, he basically gave Aristotle's answer, which was that, well, human beings are capable of image. They're able to grasp... Um, uh, concepts. Concepts are immaterial. Therefore, there must be something immaterial about human nature, mm -hmm. and uh, and then then thus the the immateriality of the intellect and uh, so forth. Um, um, yes. So um, so that's basically. It's, it seems to me that your research program is is a continuation of that, but you would embrace much more complexity than uh, than Aristotle was uh, well, that's able right, to. Because... All of all of these other specializations didn't exist at the time, so he didn't yeah. have access to that, that that possibility. But or nor did Thomas Aquinas, or nor did for that matter the Enlightened philosophers. I mean, a lot of our knowledge is very very recent and has accumulated the last hundred and fifty years, and it's somewhat it's startling to go back. To, to the fact that Dharma, before Dharma, there was no concept of evolution. <laughs> there were right. a few stumbling attempts, but it seems so obvious now, but we didn't know that. And there were, you know, you take the great uh, observation collectors, uh, uh, Helmholtz, uh, uh, any number of people in the, the 18th century, uh, as well as the 19th, who were giants of science. They didn't know about evolution. I mean, it's amazing. They yeah. went around collecting data about the shape of the Earth, the size of the Earth. That was the big obsession of the 18th and early yeah. 19th yeah. century. So they were going out measuring the atmosphere all over the world, and they discovering that it got thinner as it went up, and that uh, there was a very, very close relationship between gravity and, and and these things. I mean, all that had to be documented. They had, they had to travel all over the world in wooden boats, you know, that were 60, 70 feet long uh, just to get that data uh, because there was no globalization. There were no observation posts. I mean, you know, that kind of thing had to be done. Heroic science, the, the geologists, you know, the, the surveyors, all that data. I think uh, David Thompson uh, was heroic, an amazing human being. And of course, the, the first one to get all across the North American continent, but that was 
that you know, was very recent. We have to realize they had prior to that they really had very little to work with, and they got amazingly far when you consider that. And of course, the apparatus we built in the last hundred years is astonishing, but it totally revolutionizes the process of constructing the theory because you have set such a large amount of data available. Yeah, they were really amazing. And Aristotle as well was an amazing person. This would be oh, jumping was, ahead yeah. to describe yeah. how amazing Aristotle was. Um, yeah. I remember uh, taking a, I think it was called a psychology or no, no it was a neuroscience course. And uh, the professor just thrashed uh, Aristotle. And <laughs> I thought to myself, oh, my goodness, you try building an edifice of knowledge uh, before Christ. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is like a, a mouse trying to flagellate a, a mastodon, you know. <laughs> yeah. But what are you going to do? Uh, the average academic is not necessarily, uh, he may be an intellectual, but he's not necessarily intelligent. I mean, intellectuals are very conservative people. And uh, one thing I know is that uh, Academics, and that includes professors, can be the most conservative, most in the box uh, type of thinkers there are because they perpetuate uh, ideologies and beliefs that are very rigid simply because they've been so, so thoroughly trapped in their own assumptions. But to get out of them it is not easy to think your way out of that box once you're in it. Whereas the average layman has never been in the box. So in a sense, is still free, the way a child is free, which is, but the hard part is to get into a box and then think your way out of it. Yes. It's not easy. Well, well exposure to other points of view. And I guess this is where taking a variety of courses, I don't know which courses this particular professor who is very knowledgeable in his dis uh, discipline um, would have had uh uh, you know, what, what courses, what philosophy courses he would have taken. Personally, I had the good fortune of uh, being interested in philosophy on my way into uh, my university degree and even thinking I might minor or uh, major in that. So I took a fair amount of uh, classical philosophy and uh, mm -hmm. um, so on. So I was always um, interested in that question. Well, if you, you know, the difference, it, the, you know, what's different, what's particular about, about us and how do we differ? And uh, you see, the edifice of knowledge that Aristotle tried to put together is just mind mind blowing. Yes, I mean when you realize where he came from and compare him to Plato or Socrates, yes, I mean it's just astonishing. It's amazing. But that was the, that was the foundation of Western civilization. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah, so maybe um, I guess we'll come back to that when you uh, talk to us about the mythic, uh, the transition from mythic to theoretic. But perhaps we could go uh, for our listeners and talk about uh, um, the different forms of awareness that you identify in your theory, starting from uh, the more basic uh, level, what you call level one to the third level. Oh, yes. Well, first of all, I should, I should say that I have spelled out in several papers as well as about the... Uh, the, the, the fact that there are many definitions of consciousness that yes. use very different standards. Yes, yes, so yes. The state definition is is very common and one really related to both sleep and drug taking, and and that simply defines consciousness as a state of mind that we call arousal or alertness, and the the electrophysiology, which was one of my first specializations um, of, of the study of the electrophysiology of the brain has clearly shown the different rhythms of the brain related very closely to the state of consciousness of the individual. And um, that that is one kind of definition uh, that people use. And there, there are other definitions, of course. And uh, another one is a, an architectural definition. So that one that a lot of people don't understand, but Consciousness is kind of a place. You can think of it as a, a sort of bubble you travel in through your whole life. And that's the thing that allows you to identify yourself as a single continuous individual over time because your experiences 
very disconnected over time. And if you didn't have that memory of having had previous conscious experiences, you would have no unity. Uh, you'd be sort of like a, a computational program that is is mm -hmm. uh, artifact artificially held together. But the fact that something that happened to me 60 years ago, 70 years ago, can be fresh as if it happened five minutes ago is, you know, a very strong validation that I'm the same individual physically existed in the world 60 years ago, even though I don't share a single eye with the individual that existed at that time. And so I, I am kind of living in a spaceship traveling through time and space called consciousness. That's all I've got. If I don't have that continuity, uh, I'm in the position of, of, of many people who have either dementia or uh, serious memory loss and episodic memory who are living in the eternal present and right. desperately trying to validate who they are, who the who people around them are, and so on. So that, that architectural definition suggests that there must be a place in the brain where it or a system in the brain that somehow does this, that, that remembers things in a way that that place them in time and space. Now, that uh, architectural definition led to the cognitive revolution, as you did, if you will, but a lot of modern psychology made a lot, in fact, too much of the fact that we do a lot of things unconsciously. And they made a very fundamental mistake, which is to say, because we can do so many things in consciousness, and consciousness is, is uh, not effective, it doesn't do anything. That's silly. I mean, everything that we do unconsciously has been practiced consciously hundreds, if not thousands of times. Mm -hmm. You know, like speaking, for example, we, in, in a very young child, every ion in the brain is focused on understanding the moment because it's a buzzing, blooming confusion right, for, the, for the young child. You don't get something like an automatic language system that you rely on altogether to even think about what you're going to have for dinner. Um, you don't. It doesn't happen by accident. You, you're not born with that. All, all of us pass through consciousness at some point or another. Yeah. And uh, that's an obvious point, but it's been missed by the number of specialists who overemphasized unconscious processing, uh, the whole chaos or the scandal around behavioral economics, for example, and the fact that they can't replicate so many experiments. Uh, well, that, that was a fundamental mistake. I mean, I, I know John Berg, and, and he's a very nice fellow, a very bright guy, but the truth is, a lot of those experiments could not be replicated, and uh, the reason is that they, they made that fundamental mistake at the very beginning. Hmm. Anyway, that's another kind of definition. The final definition is a representational definition of consciousness, where, um, you know, people in fields like... Uh, literary studies, uh, film studies, uh, uh, certain areas of linguistics and so on, uh, uh, as human, that it's the text or it's the the culture, the culture that makes us conscious of anything and prior that culture wasn't conscious. That's kind of silly if you look at it very analytically, but it's understandable if you've been immersed in literature all your life and you're thinking only in terms of you know, what critics are writing for them, or what novelists are creating, or, or whatever, um, or con what conscious, what scientists are consciously writing down. Um, so the representational definition is a big field, but obviously you, you can't restrict yourself to any of those three approaches, the state, okay. architectural, and, and or representational. On the other hand, you can't leave it out. And, and so what you're really looking for is a larger architectural structure that will encompass all of these definitions. And right. I have one paper 
that spells that out in detail. That appeared later in my book. Anyway, that's so. Um, I think that the the whole notion of uh, information processing architecture did not and still does not have a lot of uh, traction in uh, even in, in cognitive psychology. Um, uh, Alan Newell wrote. Can I grab the book? It's somewhere around here. I'd like to have yeah, it handy, have but apparently yeah. I don't. Okay. He wrote a book uh, on uh, uh, his, uh, and I can't remember the, the title of the book, but basically he was one of the first people who who introduced, who who discussed uh, information processing architectures. Um, but Yeah, that was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah 1990. Simon and Newell yeah. and, and all those Well, yeah. oh, here it is. Beautiful. Unified theories of con conscious, uh, not of consciousness, of co of cognition. But uh, right. Simon, uh, yeah, Simon actually didn't. Um, he didn't buy into the whole this this whole project. So this one is not this one. This book is not co-authored. He he didn't okay. think it was important, um, or yeah. didn't think it could be um, it could be understood. So he preferred smaller scale uh, smaller scale theorizing. Uh, one thing about Newell's book is that it it's it's pretty dry it doesn't deal with uh uh motivation or motivation or emotions uh so it doesn't really address the um autonomous agency um as such but anyways it was uh it was a it was an effort and it was um uh kind of a rarity so so you you were a pioneer in 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 um uh proposing that we think in terms of the architecture you know of the mm -hmm. of the mind brain the uh, other person who comes to mind, of course, is Sigmund Freud with his big architecture of the id, yes. ego, superego. Yes, I think that, that Freud had a very interesting and, and very catchy idea in the id, ego, and superego, but that's entirely a, a cultural overlay. And I think uh, mm -hmm. that particular structure um, addressed his culture very well. I don't know yeah. that it would work very well in the other that's a, that's a whole different yeah of, yeah that's a good point it fits very much with your theory about the importance of culture i mean it being your criticism um so coming back to what you were saying about um the importance of consciousness and i in your book you mentioned that um you know in order for uh complex skills to be learned they uh the information has to go through this 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 funnel um and it's it's some aspect of consciousness. You mentioned attention and working memory as being important in this respect. And I think you, I'm not sure now if it's in your book that uh, um, it's mentioned that you know for children even to learn a language they have to pay attention. They can't Which just be, is. they they can't just have. You can't because because some of us think well as long as they can be in the background and and hear what we're saying that they they'll just magic not magically but they'll they'll, they'll pick it up through it. some kind of osmosis. But you you, you believe attention is important. Yeah, a Canadian developmental psychologist named Peter Jusic, I think died some years ago. He uh, he focused on the attentional hooks that children have to focus on in order to learn things. You have to first learn where to attend, you know, and that takes a long time. And before you can understand the words that are being spoken with the bamboo gathers around the table for dinner, you have to first of all realize that the child doesn't even know that these are people yet, <laughs> or, right. or that they're individuals, the same individuals across time and space. All of that has to be figured out. Then you have to figure out the, what the utterances are in a very general sense for what, you know, what motivates them, what kinds of emotions they evoke. You then you still don't know that there is such a thing as language or, or words or anything else, and then you have to find a, a way of finding which of those things are important and so on. And you keep chasing these attentional hooks, and eventually you get to sounds and words, and then you have to find the boundaries between words and recurrent sounds that uh, you realize are actually. Mm -hmm. Words in their own right, you know. So that takes a long, long time, and the child has to be a sort of uh, perceptual genius to cut through all that noise, and finally arrive at a point where they they realize there's a speech stream <laughs> right. that can be analyzed, and so 
but you, you know, it, it's kind of by you to, to do it once you do it. You realize that to approach it in the other way, but unfortunately, uh, this is still a lot of naivety around. Would autism be an example of where this goes awry, where they don't, the That's autistic right. children don't necessarily pay attention to the right information? Some, the ones that never learn language, yes, that's the, the fundamental thing they bump into. Um, and uh, you know, that's certainly, but it's also that there can be other contributing factors than attention, um, such as emotional sensitivity or um, ability to empathize and so on and so on. But they all come into play. And when I say attention, what well, I mean more than in the dry computational sense of attention, because attention is very much engulfed by emotions very often and guided by emotions. You know. Yes. But yes, it's complicated. Yeah. So, so, um, so, so, so for us to, um, learn and behave competently, we need to, the inf information needs to be funneled through something, um, working memory being one of the components. I was wondering if you could distinguish the, you know, your three levels of awareness in terms of sensory binding and, and so forth. Oh, yes. No, that's, that's a very interesting uh, puzzle. Um, the very fundamental perceptual level of assembling coherent objects and events. Well, I put a lot of focus on that. I don't think you've ever read my paper on slow process, you know, what I call it, the slow process, that came out of the, uh, the conference we had in France in uh, mid, uh, I guess in mid 2000s. Um, and, uh, but it's been published in the Journal of Physiology of Paris. It's called uh, the slow process. I don't know. I think I sent it to you, but I didn't. Yeah, you did, and I only had time to skim it. I, I have read your your uh, a mind so rare book, um, yeah. but the audience would not necessarily have. So, um, yeah, and so I know you, also, you. Go ahead. That paper went beyond the point. Oh, it I did go beyond it. Eh? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, interesting. Quite a bit. Yeah, the, the the idea is that the early stage of assembling what what we call consciousness very much was linked with the extension of the temporal spread of attention um, because uh, in, if you try to get very reductive about a, a perceptual act and how you get from let's say an insect to a more complex creature like a, a, a simple mammal or a bird or even a reptile um, you, you see that uh, the transition involves mostly being sensitive, being able to perceive things that endure in time, you know, that uh, for much longer periods than, than mm -hmm. the things that are typically picked up by insects. Um, and uh, how do you integrate over time for that period? Let's say you're moving from mere milliseconds, sorry about this, this camera. It's yeah, I noticed it's got a mind of its own. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it sometimes tilts back. But, um, anyway, I should do something about the old technology around here, but I'm, yeah. you know, you get tired after you've been through twelve different generations of technology. You just get sick of it. <laughs> you, yeah, I mean, you just you just want things to work. Uh, anyway, that's right. Who cares <laughs> the details? Um, yeah. The, the thing is that. Uh, in order to explain the very early move in the evolution towards a wider world of perception, which I think is where you, you have to root consciousness in sensation and perception. You know? Yes. Um, well, you have to move from very limited perceptions to much wider perceptions that involve much more integration. And uh, so, for example, a frog uh, will see a, a fly zoom across its field and it suddenly jumps incredibly accurately, swallows the insect and it bounces back to where it was. And that's it. And it sits mm -hmm. there until the next one comes along. It's, <clears throat> it's got a very limited view of the world that extends over certain events that only endure for, for a very short period. That's still 
difficult to achieve. But then right. the next step <laughs> involves turning that into an event, an identifiable event with its own characteristics that are different from a different type of event. You have to be able to do that to engage in meeting behavior or any number of things. So your world, as you get more social, becomes even longer. I mean, social events can last for a very long period of time. That dominance fight, a rivalry, jealousy, et cetera. <clears throat> Those are perceptions that don't have to be represented in language, but are very common in animals. In fact, uh, building blocks of social interactions, but they involve a, a perceptual dimension that is very much related to, I think, the elementary origins of consciousness. So you, a, per, a person who's only perceptually aware is aware. I, I, I need to put any kind of qualifier on that. Um, and uh, they're aware both from a state point of view and a, and a uh, architectural point of view. And uh, they're not representational. That's uh, you know uh, something that I think probably is restricted to humans or very powerfully advanced uh, mammalian and avian uh, minds. But that's all. It's it's a, it's a more uh, more a human thing. But certain the first two definitions of consciousness uh, apply in some degree to to an individual that they can do that. So you you the building blocks are there. But not for philosophy. <laughs> right. The building blocks for right. analytic thought and so on are representation mostly anyway. But you need this other stuff first. You can't get representation until your perceptual apparatus is quite advanced. Right, right. Um going back to the mean, insects. I, I think you mentioned I think you go ahead. No, go ahead. To be that advanced, you need the state side too, because the, you need that, um, that accelerator or that um, extra little boost that you get in, uh, going from, let's say, a neutral state of awareness to, to highly alert, you know, to frenetically alert, <laughs> which you right. know, what this, they have good creators. Right. So a, a spider. Uh, you mentioned in your book that you know spiders can um, kind of triangulate uh, and uh, uh, catch sight of uh, of an insect like, and then do certain moves. Quite intelligent, you know, they can yeah. perceive things that are not, not directly perceptible. That is, they can construct the you know, from afar, and uh, it, it's not. I don't don't think it's inference, but I think it's some kind of um, Gap to the type of perception, um, but, but we don't fully understand. But we know it does exist in very simple creatures. Hmm. <clears throat> and what about the binding problem? How how important is that to understanding consciousness? Well, well absolutely, uh, because you need to be able to bind so many different elements to create a percept. Uh, let's say to recognize one face across hundreds of different lighting situations as being the same face and another face that in one respect may be more similar to the face as a different face across different lighting situations. That's a very complex perceptual problem. And I think uh, you know, the uh, computer programmers who were trying to build Facial recognition devices discovered that uh, right. pretty early on. I mean, I think that's a really tough problem, and um, I think some psychologists were aware of that. But, but I think the computer people contributed a lot to, to that realization. Yes. But <clears throat> in order to bind together all the elements that you have to do to, to recognize a face, it's, it's not simple, and um, Neural net uh, approach is obviously the, the very, it's got it's got to be scientifically tied to the way neurons function in a network, but we don't 
fully understand that. I think Hinton would, was, his early work was brilliant on this. I cited it in the book. Uh, but, uh, that's, but, you know, the thing is, you, you have to be able to, uh, to, to do something like that, to, to take apart the complexity of the problem of sticking all of these things in, into one kind of formula of your work and, and coming up with a solution. And I think we, the reason we don't understand it in the brain is we don't understand yet uh, what a cortical column does. I mean, it's incredible, 100,000 units in, in, in standard configuration, and there's so many of these in the brain, a vast, vast number. <clears throat> uh, each one of them being used to a sort of 100K system. Uh, we just do it, 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 its logic hasn't yet come out. I think the neural net theory is, it works well, but it's probably much simpler than what it actually was on. Because the digital system uh, is necessarily simpler than the analog system. I mean, I, the, some of the first computers I used in electrophysiology were analog, but we didn't. You know, we, we didn't go very far because we don't understand a lot about the mind of our computer. Unfortunately, that's what a brain is. <laughs> and so it's limited our, our progress. But nevertheless, the digital simulation of that seems to be incredibly powerful. Yes. So you'd say that um, um, it, these organisms were capable of binding information into uh, a yeah. stable representation of say of a predator or prey um that uh, there's something happening uh that yes. needs an architectural uh definition for some level of consciousness or more generally in your view um understanding consciousness is a matter of understanding this space of possible and actual organisms and what they're capable of yeah something like that i, I think it's a uh... Uh, you can't uh, you, you can't restrict yourselves to one aspect of that statement or another. I mean, so many things are relevant to defining how a conscious mind can be conceived. I think if you're, um, you're dealing with uh, you know a, a very complex problem, and uh, that's why I, I don't emphasize very much those kinds of generalizations because uh, the, uh, there are so many exceptions. <laughs> you know, it basically you take anything that seems relevant and you know, take mm -hmm. out the, the truth that is in there and, and, and stop pontificating about method. <laughs> I think methodology is the refuge of mediocre minds. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> that's that's that's, that's what <laughs> I think. No, but I think you know I can remember so many professors who used to hammer that you have to do it this way, you have to do it that way. Baloney. Yeah. Basically, you grab hold of every piece of evidence you lay yeah. your hands on. The, the, you know, no matter where it comes from, you try to find out how things work. And uh, right, right, usually, right. You know. Anyway. Well, that's uh, very well put. No matter how, where you know. No matter where the data comes from, you, you try to figure yeah. out how they work. Um, yeah. And uh, and methodology is the refuge of mediocre minds, listeners. <laughs> so don't get obsessed with methodology. It's a means to an end, not an end in itself. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I'm, the audience is getting a flavor of the fact that you're an interdisciplinary uh, person. And part of the integration that you do is integrating data across multiple fields to come up with a, an, an understanding um uh, of, of 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 consciousness. Mm -hmm. So I, one thing I'd like to pitch by you, since we've talked about the binding problems, um, there's uh, there are different kinds of binding problems. Uh, we've talked about sensory binding. There's also um, source memory binding, and whether that's maybe a uh, a different well, it's a different beast, but it, uh, there's a similarity there, and that is that when you acquire a piece of information it's sometimes useful to know where 
where where that information comes from. For instance, that so and so is a difficult or unpleasant or unworthy person. Um, did you hear that in a political advertisement, or was it a trusted friend who who told you that? So that's kind of what they call the source memory binding problem. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, another form of binding, which I didn't use this expression in my PhD thesis, but I came across as I did a, um, uh, I was working on design based or design, st uh, design stance is a better way to put it now because design based means something different uh, these days, but uh, computer simulations of gold processing and autonomous agents. And uh, when you run computer simulations of uh, that are not merely predictive, but meant to understand phenomena, you uh, you run into all kinds of problems that were not necessarily apparent before. And you mentioned Jeffrey Hinton working on uh, uh, on on some some uh, perceptual issues uh, that uh, where he had to face uh, complexity. So one of the issues I found was that uh, my little simulated robot. Um, would respond to problems and need to create a motivational structure. So I had these robot babies that the robot nursemaid was looking after and the babies could fall into ditches. So the uh, the nursemaid was the agent that I was most interested in here. And she 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 had to keep an eye out for these kids, uh, these these robot babies. And, uh, and I found that the same stimulus in the env environment could, would repeatedly trigger uh the creation of a motivator but a new motivate new motivational structure so somehow somehow the nursemaid needed to be able to recognize that the problem that this new so-called new motivator is actually an old motivator so it it has to have a persistent state a persistent motivational state if you will which we call the motivator that represents a situation towards which a particular situation towards which it has some kind of a motivational attitude. In this case, it was to make sure that the, the robot babies didn't fall into a ditch. So somehow that need, needed to be persisted. So this is, um, as I see it, it's a different kind of binding. It's, I call, I would call it today motivational binding. How, how do you think that fits into the different, you know, forms of binding problems that, that uh, evolution solved. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't consider that when I yeah, first formulated my ideas. Um, that, that's a very different issue. I think it's formally similar in this to binding in the sense that it, you're 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 associating somehow two things that may not be innately associated but on the other hand um uh, the the formal similarity does not necessarily mean a mechanism that is similar in the brain mm -hmm. Mind you, I, I that, that really doesn't matter if you right. take a purely a behavioristic approach if you want but um i think uh, uh we don't know enough about the, the Specific neural architectures that are involved in the very principles. Of, I'm not talking about uh, structures anatomically, but the, the yeah. organizational uh, logic, if you want, of the system. And we still don't really know very much about that, unfortunately. And, and we we may eventually, but uh, the group at Harvard who were working on uh, essentially a, a very, very detailed anatomical model of the interconnections and synapses in the brain. Um, I mean, they, if you look at the, the, the recent data, it's, it's kind of discouraging in a way. It's so mm -hmm. complex that you wonder, what do they need by way of an analytic machine to try to figure out Yes. What these hundreds of thousands of connections per square, you know, millimeter or something yeah. amount to, um, and um, and how do they work? It's, it's yeah, I have no reason to think that eventually somebody will figure out a method, but it's not going to be simple. It's going to be yeah. some some kind of meta method that involves all kinds of technology and so on. But um, I think um, the uh, the in, in principle, in the abstract, yes, that, that probably is a kind of binding that does does involve um, 
memory, mind binding does involve memory anyway, perceptual binding. Um, there's no question about that. So why not? But I mean, uh, yeah, it, it's a valid idea, but I don't think we have the slightest right. idea. I'm sorry, my my. Yeah, let's keep you getting your exercise, Merlin, this morning. You won't need to go for yeah, a walk. Well, I'm trying to trying to figure this thing out. I, I mean, let's try to solve it a little better. I think that might last better. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Something needs to be tightened there. It's, it looks like. Um, uh, well, where was I going with uh, with all this? Oh, yeah, I was uh, reminded of uh, uh, Seth Grant, uh, who's. Um, a bio, uh, what would you call him? Well, he's a neuroscientist who focuses on the uh, on inter well, into the, on the synaptic juncture, and mm -hmm. in his view, the synaptic juncture is basically as com as complex as a modern supercomputer. Now he said that ten years mm -hmm. ago. So, um, but if you think of it, like there's just in you know, one neuron can have a thousand. Could have a thousand synaptic junctures, and um, or participate in thousands of synaptic junctures, and now you got this supposed eighty-three billion neurons. That's oh, I don't have my calculator to do this here. I'd have to pull it up. But that's a that's a huge number. So um, sees the number of elementary particles in the solar system or something like it, that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's it becomes a um, vast yeah. number. I mean, yeah. but I mean, I don't know what that means really. I mean, the usually the number of feasible options is much more limited because the system locks in on certain options. But I think, yes. uh, you know, um, that that's a, uh, a bit of a numbers game. I I'm mm -hmm. suspicious mm -hmm. of numbers games. But anyway, okay. Well, I mean, there's complexity. In other words, there's complexity. And uh, yeah. I, when I started my PhD, uh, I was uh, connectionism was just really taking off. Uh, mm -hmm. They had said goodbye to the uh, simple McCulloch and Pitts neurons, and we're working with more complex neural models. Um, mm -hmm. But um, so, and there was all, of course, some rivalry between the connections connectionists and the symbolic programmers or uh, or modelers, um, and. Uh, the idea that you can build a machine, you know, that that's, that's more similar to what the brain is doing, um, kind of falls a little bit flat when you take Seth Grant's argument seriously. Anyway, but but as you said, it's a numbers game. So I thought maybe we could switch to talking about the executive suite to give uh, mm. uh, listeners a a, a, um, a picture of your view of consciousness and how um, this. Um, set of capabilities is uh important to understanding who what what's special about human beings mm -hmm. well i mean um that's a that's a very very big question uh, i'm just trying to get a slide a, a, sure a, sure sure i don't know if i, I can show it but um uh, we'll give it a try so that, and I, i'm gonna i'm gonna click a button but to allow you this huge set of slides I have on consciousness, because uh, I haven't been talking about the subject for a while now, because I, I, I kind of swept up in the fourth transition stuff. And, yes, and well, the, we can get uh, to that. And I, the consciousness uh, issues, uh, as I said, the, the, the consciousness establishment went in a different direction. I was too busy with the evolution uh, stuff to to kind of cover all my bases, but um, there is a, um, a kind of perspective. I didn't even have to find this. Um, it's a. Um, I have a lot of material, but my goodness, too much. <laughs> yes, I have to re recommend to the. Uh, listeners, the uh, your book, A Mind So Rare, and point out while you're uh, getting your slides organized that um, that it was Aaron Sloman who introduced me to your work. I forwarded you an email that he sent me in 2013, and uh, he doesn't always have um, flattering things to say about empirical psychology or psychology in general. So I thought, well, if Aaron's saying I should read this book, I'm going to read this book. So I set out and I, I read your book, and I was one of the hardliners who thought that the term consciousness was basically uh, treating that as a scientific subject was uh, making a reification fallacy that we're mm -hmm. capable of 
uh, we have all these capabilities, but we don't necessarily have this thing called consciousness. But your your book um, made me realize that uh, I was missing out. <laughs> I was missing out, <laughs> and it I, it caused a revolution in my thinking about about human nature. Um, and since then, I've thought, well, it's actually very useful to think in terms of in terms of consciousness. Um, and uh, well, we haven't talked about your your evolution, your evolutionary, the evolutionary part of your theory yet, which is such an important part of it. Um, but um, this uh, obviously it, it fit very well with my own thinking, but it extend it extended it as well. And one thing, one way in which I think about your theorizing is that your, um, I mean you're coming up with a functional specification of the capabilities of different animals and and you and different and 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 human beings in particular and i would argue um you know individual differences and developmental differences as well yeah well i mean you know uh, first of all i just say parenthetically i i don't know if you were Philosophers realize that the humor in, in, in criticisms and that philosophers could be capable of a reification fallacy. I, I, I don't normally think of them as uh, the most uh, grounded. <laughs> uh, that's that's funny. Or even people, you know, if any, if yeah. anyone is more inclined than a physicist to a, a fantastic. In view of reality, it is a philosopher. <laughs> yeah, uh, but that's okay. And they're paid for it too. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's also a big, uh, big advantage in life, I guess, in some sense. Um, I don't know whether uh, you can see this. Uh, this is a, well, there, I, 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 we can turn on sharing. Well, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of doing this. Oh, look at that. Screen. We could so do it that way. Screen. This is I, from the uh, a paper on the slow process that. Uh, right. I don't, I don't know if this oh, nice colors. Part. Yeah, nice we've got colors. part of it. Yeah, well, we can see that. Yeah, you can see it. Yeah. Okay. So what this is is um, a mechanism that links brain and culture through consciousness. And I don't. I haven't talked of the, the concept of intermediate term governance. The, I put a huge yes. emphasis on being distinctively human, but. Mm -hmm. Um, binding is the most elementary uh, process, and I don't think it may be a single process. It may be different mm -hmm. because there are different kinds of binding. Short-term working memory is is an extension of that into uh, longer periods uh, of seconds rather than tenths or hundredths of a second. Intermediate term governance can be a much longer kind of thing, and that's a kind of consciousness. Where human beings dwell, I think that that is is the world we live in. Uh, so it's a longer time frame than the insects and s simple animals are very good at binding. We can be extraordinary in uh, short term uh, working memory, uh, but they can get lost in the complexities of intermediate term governments, longer term periods of time. And the th presence of ITG means. Uh, human working memory and and intersubjectivity, the culture, uh, become fundamentally restructured. Uh, they contain, of course, a lot of automated skills that have initially gone through consciousness, but it is it is a vital link in being able to build complex representation of cultures, which humans do, and that that's overly simple, but it does. When you consider the number of processes underlying the surface, you, you're either ways, you're dealing with a super complex system, and uh, um, I I won't yeah. dwell on this forever. But it's it's a um, you know it's a it's it, that particular paper uh, on the slow process I think it illustrates a lot of things, but it's very abstract and a lot of people uh, don't necessarily pick it up right away but i think eventually yeah. they, i think people will get around to realizing well, that that is the structure of the problem uh, well, that you have to solve but i mean to get into it you've got so many 
some problems that have to be solved yeah. empirically. But I think you, 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 that's the kind of question you can't ask about consciousness. You can't ask why any kind of physical mechanism can mediate a process like this. There's no point in dwelling on it. But that question itself can be answered. I think it will be. Yeah. Eventually. Yes, yes. You know, there's um, an interesting overlap between your work and and the work of uh Aaron Solomon that I'm going to talk I'm going to interview Aaron assuming okay. he's 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 up to it because he's not feeling 100% these days but uh um and my the, the work I did my PhD thesis which was in obviously in his tradition in uh we uh I didn't use the term executive processes I spoke about management processes but it's the same thing it's essentially these well an important set of functions is that that is 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 actually goal oriented. Is that the an a, an autonomous agent like human beings capable of generating these motivational states? And then what you do? Well, you can deliberate on them to decide whether, when, and how to uh, pursue them. And that requires uh, that requires creating representations of possible states of affairs um, to, to, that 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 you might pursue. So the the there's the planning. You know the how part is the planning. You have to be able to come up in your head somehow with a number of mm-hmm. alternatives and, and plan about them uh, to decide whether you should pursue something. You have to be able to imagine a world in which you pursue the motivator and a world in which you don't, and what happens after that. The when mm-hmm. the win part is also win w h e n is also tied to um, um, is also tied to uh, uh, to imagining potential states of affairs. What happens if I do it right now versus uh, later, when say the enemy isn't <laughs> isn't uh, approaching, um, so so uh, and that entails understanding understanding the importance and the urgency of uh, of, of of problems, and that's just one angle basically. But uh, so what you've called the executive suite in my own work, I referred to as management processes, but then later I aligned it to uh, the terminology that's more common now. That's this kind of canonical uh terminology um so there's a interesting overlap there um okay i don't i'm i'm mindful that we've been at it for an hour and a half and you might be uh needing needing a break or um we haven't even uh, warmed up oh <laughs> uh, yeah we've we've i think we're going to need another meeting here um we we have we have not really uh warmed up um i just well on the executive suite i want to uh, uh highlight that uh, Bernard Bars, I mean, does this con- your approach contrasts a bit with the, that of Bernard Bars in yeah. in this particular instance here? Because he's careful to say the executive processes are not, uh, you know, he doesn't identify them with consciousness. He says consciousness is this is this whiteboard on which, or blackboard <laughs> in those days, it's a blackboard on which um, on which, uh, yeah, and it's that 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 different agents in the mind contend for um so it's basically consciousness for him is the broadcasting system and the and the broadcasting space um so would you is this an opportunity to distinguish your theory from that of bernard bars well it's very different i mean the, the, his is almost exclusively focused on the nervous system and on the subsystems that support it better. Consciousness and in general control processing, if you want, which I think is a very important way of approaching it. But uh, I'm, um, this is a very different approach. Uh, and it, um, in a way, addressing many different levels of, of organization, that some of which are, are not neural, uh, and some of which. Right. Uh, you know, in, in our even cultural uh, and so on, and in a continuum that is all the way from binding up to the most right. complex aspects of inner subjectivity. Uh, consciousness is is almost like, well, I use the, the word uh, flashbulb memory sometimes in memory theory, but I mean, it's it, it's not necessarily a broadcast system that it posts things up the board. I know I know that the that computer people like that analogy. Mm-hmm. That, that's one reason it works well. It's a, mm-hmm. But the truth is, that's it's more like lighting up, but very selectively. Uh, 
why that happens in such extraordinarily complex and so selective ways is interesting. But uh, you know, an example would be you you walk into a room and of uh, some friends, and there's a, a party going on, and there are, let's say, a hundred people in this huge room, and you walk in and you instantly know that there has been some kind of an incident five minutes earlier in the room, mm -hmm. and you pick up the electricity, there has been some major disagreement, and in milliseconds, mm -hmm. it seems, you realize that it must be between X and Y, and it can't be anybody else. You, how do you explain that? There's no broadcasting. I mean, you cut through all kinds of uh, possibilities like lightning. And that's one reason uh, I've argued that actually I don't think neuro neurons mediate uh, most kind of cognition of that sort. That is, people still support the neuron doctrine more or less out of habit because mm. um, you know there are obviously important structures and I think that neurons do the, the hard work of the the be suburban you know they haul things into the nervous system they shimp them from one place to another they haul things out of the nervous system into the musculature or the exocrine grams or whatever but they um, are they capable of, of lightning reorganization of that sort i don't think so i think mm. i th i think it has to be another process most likely electromagnetic that's virtually instantaneous that cuts across long distances neuronally that would take you right but you know significant time to to especially chemically come across it to, to, if you argue, for example, as Hugo Weasel once did very unsuccessfully, that there are hierarchies uh, uh, dependent on neural processing that are the basis of, of perception. I mean, that, that doesn't make any sense if you look at the time parameters. Um, and uh, so, what is the uh, process? Well, I would say. It may be different for the different stages if you go through binding and you know, different stages of, of, of working memory and so on. Um, the process may be quite different. It, it, it may not be a single process. I would say it's very unlikely to be because uh, otherwise uh, consciousness would, would not have a fairly neat evolutionary structure that appears to have. So I think, you know, the the Underlying processes are not, not simple. We shouldn't assume that they are. Okay. So this this hundred walking into a room with and being able to notice that oh something's happened um, yeah, is is that. is one example. Another example you give is a is of a conversation and what's required to keep information in mind. And I thought that was a particularly yes. useful example. Um, uh, well, I I could. You have room for a slideshow. It would take a, yep. a sure. few seconds. I, I don't know if I can set it up. Um, I I came up with this particular slideshow in I it was a I, it was at the University of Aarhus. I had a, a an honorary professorship there for years, for about ten years, um, and I was a very good graphic artist. Oh, uh, well, what university did you say? Warwick? Warhus in Denmark. It's a, it's a Danish university. It's oh, Dan. The second best known university oh, well. in, in Scandinavia, I think. It's very, very okay. good. Um, okay. But it, it's, um, I had a, an honorary professorship there from, from something like uh, 2007 to 2017 or something like that. Wow. Um, okay. Uh, well, I'll put that in the show notes. Yeah, if you want. I mean, I, I've had. Countless. Yeah, you've been you've been around. <laughs> yeah, and there are quite a few things like that. Let's see. I'm just trying to see where I have the best um, version of this. There are many different versions. Um, 
it to them and think, okay, this this might work. And so I was talking a uh, Zoom session in Berkeley um, years ago. Let's see whether this works. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is the whole thing. Now, um, can I arrange this so that my camera is stable? Um, if you want to share your screen, we'd be able to see. The... Yes, I, I think that would be a good idea. That There's a share better. screen. There's a button yes. at the bottom below. Yes, I can, I can see that. Um, let me just uh, get rid of this for the moment. Come on. Come on, Phyllis. Don't do this to me. Um, for some reason, something popped up in my screen that I didn't want. I can't get rid of it. Well, we might be. I might be able to overlay it uh, with a bit of editing. Well, let me let me just uh, bring this up to you. No, this is ridiculous. This thing is still there. You go away. Why would that be? All right. Um, yeah. All right. So let's see if we can share this screen and go into presentation mode. No, I mean, I have to go share screen first, I guess. All right. Um, can you see it? What do you see? No, I, I'm still seeing you. Um, I don't want to see that. I don't want to look at us. It, it, it there I is, um, my other screen. It should give there you an option two... of what screen to look to, 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 yeah, yeah, to display. I don't know if it sees the two screens. I, I have to, uh... it should be aware of it. If different... I've used this many times, I've given many times. If you, yeah, yeah, if you click the button normally. Um, it would give you, it will pop up a list of, you can even share a particular window. Yeah. I'm not is. an expert on this myself. I managed to get through the pandemic without too many meetings. It was blissful. Well, Although I'm enjoying this meeting. I gave uh, a lot of talks during the pandemic that were strictly Zoom. And I shared screen to do that, of course. Um, and I want to share you know, two screens because one is... The Zoom screen with my images and so on. This one, and the other one is uh, is a uh, screen too, if you want. Um, yeah. And I appear usually as a a small image in the corner when I mm -hmm, do screen. Mm -hmm. But this is what's happening you now. Now I'm still, you still see me, right? Yes, well, I do. Let me. Yep. Yeah. Let, so let me try this other idea. Yeah. The old fashioned I'll, technique. Yeah. I'll just show a picture of the screen if I can get it on. Oh, look Let's at see. that. Okay. Oh, okay. So, so that William is, James at the bottom, at the left, or no, or some German. No, it's Charles Darwin. Oh, it's Charles Darwin's. Okay. Zoom in. All yeah. right. I can see that. The other one okay. is Wilberforce. Okay. He was one of the anti slavery guys. All oh, right. And, uh, the famous debate was between Charles Darwin's cousin Galton and Wilberforce. Anyway, I have I have here Darwin and Charlie Chaplin is listening to the yeah. conversation between the two of them. All right. Now um, let's see if I can get this to work. It's pretty primitive. I'm sorry for this, but I didn't anticipate doing it. But um, this is a an illustration of what is going through the mind of Charles uh, Charlie Chaplin as he listens to the conversation between these people. I, I don't know whether your image is big enough to. Uh, I, I we to can see uh, the whole slide. Okay, underneath this, there is um, a conversation taking place. Can you read that? Yeah, the origin, the origin of, of human species. species must be investigated objectively. Okay, that's, now that's look an idea. Down below on the screen, you'll see if the, there's a little red bar where Charles Darwin has spoken. Okay, on this timeline, and 
the next thing that will appear will be a representation of that in in Charlie Chaplin's brain. So right. he he hears this. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then uh, the next uh, phase is that. <laughs> Wilberforce answers, but scripture tells a story story about our Genesis, okay. And that enters into Charlie's other now what I'm saying is that his consciousness knows in a multi agent conversation is split into two two silos and you never right. mix up the two speakers. And you'll that's true. That's right, eh? We you take it for granted, but it's an accomplishment. Yeah. You never do not only that, but you remember it hours later. Okay, so now yeah, yeah. So the next thing next thing that happens is there's another uh come on, fellas. Do this. Um so this registers in this memory. Now it gets more complicated because he says those are beautiful decisions. <laughs> they have no objective reality. Okay, so this goes into this and it's sort of like Star right. Wars and, it, the previous utterance fades, and that the, the new, most recent one is bolded. Okay, so then you go, and but your vision lacks beauty, it's cruel and demeaning. So, <laughs> the Lord of Forces latest statement is here, and, the, and so you two have you have two sliding working memory locations that never get mixed up, like that, right? And the stuff that is in those spots is incredibly complex. But there's beauty and truth, however harsh it might seem, so that is stored. You cannot explain the appearance of two species at ultimate origins. You know? So that goes uh, into a spot in his memory, uh, which indeed in these we are working, we are working on, on it. it. Yeah, that's right. That's so a scientific that, answer. Yeah. <laughs> and you do not inspire people. You do not Grant them peace and so on. The, and the other one says, right. We're working on it. So, nor do you anymore. So, this is <laughs> getting to be a kind of personal thing. And in the center, you'll notice the yellow marks are um, the absence of Charlie from the conversation. But all of a sudden, he intervenes and says, But let me interject. So, there's an utterance there. Right, right. And he opens another window for his own voice. That's right. He never yeah. mixed that with anybody else. So now you've got three windows open. And yeah. uh, again, uh, he refers to Steve Gould's idea about not overlapping magisteria. Uh, right. That, you know, and they, they say, what? Because I'm not used to having Charlie in conversation. So this is just what's in his mind. It's not, it doesn't represent what's in the other people's mind. But again, this is an intersubjective exchange. You see the stuff of human existence, you know. Um, okay, so so that's just a brief exchange of two people listening, a uh, third one listening, and then three people. And and what comes out in in the, in the person's consciousness at the end of it, what they could immediately articulate is right. what they were talking about. And you can, you, you having watched this, you can talk about speaker one, the, the self being uh, another speaker, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. speaker two. And if you look at it, the, the core idea, follow the evidence, apples and oranges, preserve tradition, methodology matters, different domains, social media matters. You, you, you can pull out the essence of, of this conversation, the conclusions, if you want. That's right. That's a very right. complicated process. You can't. Um, but I think most people thinking about consciousness uh, have, haven't yet processed it. Now, that's not in my career. Uh, no, I, I, but I, you do talk about conversations. Yes, oh yes, I do about the, the baseball conversation and or the the complexity of, of baseball. Uh, you remember that example in, in, in another one, but this is. A very good illustration, I think, that um, has been you know, used with many uh -huh. audiences over the years. I have never put it in the paper because it's not easy to, to do that. I'm not going to go beyond that, but that's, I think it's a useful little uh, image to keep in mind when you're thinking about uh, multi agent exchanges and 
representation right. of consciousness. So, anyway. it, so it seems to me that um, again, come back to this this approach to understanding ourselves and each other is is that um, if we were dealing with a really hard liner who didn't who got stuck up on on consciousness and didn't like the term, we can just say, well, we're modeling here. Uh, we have to explain these capabilities. Clearly, humans are capable of these mm -hmm. things, but we we lack a theory uh, for explaining this complexity. So we have to do justice to the to the complexity. And what you're doing is is pointing to the the you know these are capabilities that we have. Uh, how mm -hmm. do we explain them? And then yeah, uh, I'm explaining it is a part of. Don't underestimate the problem because you may miss yeah. the target altogether. I mean. There is an advantage in outlining a problem realistically, yes. um, because it may it may avoid errors that are really really fundamental and could have been avoided uh, at the beginning. That's one of the things. And yes, because a lot of people look at this and they get discouraged about what they're doing and say, "Well, why bother?" I say, "Because it's the most interesting problem in the world." <laughs> this. If, right, right. You know, this this is vital stuff. Uh, if we're ever going to exchange or develop a better uh, view of human nature, um, and that may be too late. I mean, we, we may be extinct by that time, mm -hmm. but we do have to figure out what we are to survive, I think, the, the current kind of technology that's popped out of nowhere in the century. You know, we, can we handle it? I don't know. Right. Well, there's definitely a, a set of people out there who are very interested in understanding, uh, understanding who we are, understanding human nature. So I don't think uh, I don't think one can run away uh, from this no. from this forever. But um, so I guess I guess one of the questions I, I had put in the show notes was is, is pertinent here is that um, the uptake of your theory. Um, you mentioned in a previous interview with somebody else that you know, that there are a number of places that are where we're that have taken up your your theory. Um and yet there's still a lot of room for more uptake, especially now that consciousness consciousness is getting um uh, is getting more attention. Um so I guess my my question is what what has been the 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 resistance that you've seen in taking up your theory as opposed to other theories of consciousness? Well, I think that one of the surprises was that it wasn't taken up more in uh, both neuroscience and, uh, if you want, mm -hmm. hard-nosed cognitive research. Right. In, 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 it has been taken up widely in the humanities, you know, uh, in many fields, uh, not only archaeology and anthropology, but also um, history of religion, because religions are, are complex, multi-layered cognitive governance structures, like corporations, and, and to some degree in management and, and that kind of stuff, as well as in sociology. But um, the, the, the hard core of it should re really be more popular in uh, right, the neuroscience field, and cognitive science, and the, I think the reason is that they're simply not used to this kind of thinking. I mean, most people in that field uh, get trained in one very complex methodology, and that's it. That's that. Yeah. Because I was uh, I was educated in two of those methodologies, and pretty well known up into my forties and then and then I. I think most of them assumed that I left the field because I was just very broad brain ranging largely in terms of the book, you know. Yeah, yeah. Most people have a, you know, many of them have a background in anatomy, in uh, surgery, in you know, all of the physiological side of things, or just in experimental methods in the statistics and so on, and they're obsessed with that. Right, and it's very hard to get out of that box, as I was saying. Uh, the training is not so rigid in the more humanities-oriented fields because uh, breadth is, is more valued, and uh, 
So it, it has been very mm -hmm. useful in, in a number of fields. Uh, yes. We're tying together a lot of stuff. But where I think the uptake has been disappointing has uh, been in the origin of, of a lot of this. I mean, I, I've, I've had countless invitations to colloquy in psychology departments and, and, mm -hmm. and neuroscience departments, but um, in terms of the, the actual building of these things into wide theories, the most successful was in developmental psychology. Catherine Nelson got very interested in it. Uh, and, Ooh, uh, sure. and later on, uh, it made inroads into big inroads into archaeology, cognitive archaeology yep. is now a field. Yep. Yes. A lot of it was built on my stuff in the, in the 90s. Uh, by Colin Renfrew at uh, Cambridge and so on. Uh, and uh, Bob Bella came out with a sort of groundbreaking book about uh, 2008, 2009 at Harvard uh, from, he's at Berkeley, he uh, very well known sociologist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, uh, wrote this uh, foundational book on the evolution of religion and all of the basic uh, developments that took place during uh, the so-called axial age when all of the major yeah. religions in Hinduism, Islam, uh, the precursors of the Abrahamic religions and Greek uh, philosophy all came out. And all of them had founders who were not historically uh, traceable, you know, like, like uh, Buddha, Socrates, Christ, etc. They were all um, mysteriously uh, people who left no real footprint that they could. They they all had spokesmen, you know, yes, for them, but they 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 were quoted by Plato, by the the. Uh, you know, uh, evangelists and so on uh, but um, anyway the, the structures that resulted took hundreds of years to construct and resulted in a, a multi-layer governance of the minds of the entire cultures uh, which you know because it's just the most of the globe actually uh, you could say that modern secular westerners are descendants of, of, of Christianity whether they like it or not Yes, and, and, and so on. So, a lot of the Enlightenment ideas are direct extensions of Christianity. Other could they never have occurred in the other culture. True, true. But but all that stuff uh, is very well articulated by Bob Bella's book, which two books actually. Uh, okay. A lot of it is built around my structure. Uh, so, it's been you know very successful in that direction. So, so he has. So he he references your work in his in his uh, books. Oh yes, very extensive. Okay. Very extensive. Well, I'm gonna. Building. I've got to read those books. I just heard about yeah. them on the weekend when I was listening to that podcast you shared with me, uh, which oh, yeah. I'll put in the yeah. show notes. The other one of uh, Catherine Nelson's uh, uh, psychology work in Con developmental psychology uh, showed the compatibilities between her system uh, for child the, the development of the child's mind. And my evolutionary thing, which was completely unintentional. In fact, uh, uh, coincidence is uh, quite amazing, but it, it works out quite well. She wrote a book called, uh, uh, what was it called? Language in Cognitive Development. Language in Cognitive Development, Catherine Nelson. Oh, that sounds like an important book. Yes, uh, it was somewhere in the 90s. She, she did a whole sabbatical. The book, she changed her plans. She wrote, she wrote oh. about it because my book had just come out. It was about 1994, 1995. She interrupted her plans and rewrote her project, and it, it became to integrate these two systems. Oh, interesting. Well, that's yeah, fantastic. It, yeah, and that, that's a link to a, a major experimental source in psychology because. It also it, it 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 made some kind of an impact in neuropsychology, which is one of our specialties, but not cognitive neuroscience, the uh, imaging literature. But I know a lot of those guys, and those are not they're not that kind of thinker. They yeah they're they're, they're all techies. They're, they're specialists yeah. on technology, and some of them 
actually a variable business. You know? So yeah, it's a different, a different world. I, my, as an undergraduate, uh, I had the good fortune of uh, being asked by uh, George Furiezos, Professor George Furiezos, to join his lab. I mean, he could tell that I was an interested student, um, mm -hmm. and I was very, indeed, was interested in neuroscience, and I, I pursued that, but I felt, um, I felt like I had to, uh, you know, broaden my horizons. Uh, so I did my undergraduate thesis was actually on theoretical neuroscience, the evolution of vision, which was quite yeah. an ambitious uh, topic for uh, yeah, an undergraduate. Yeah, yeah. It's a huge, but, uh, huge subject. Yeah, but I did, uh, as much as I appreciate, deeply appreciate the experience I had in a neuroscience lab, we were studying the uh, neural basis of what we thought was uh, a reward system. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, you know, that that grounded me and I still read neuroscience, but but I, I can understand what you're saying about uh, neuroscientists would have difficulty. Well, your theory is so expansive um, to right. and the question for them is going to be, OK, how can I run an experiment on this? And it's also the That's psychology right. question. And they'll all come back to their own specialty in the, their set of skills. you know. Um, yeah. And this side of me was never... Uh, public or obvious in psychology because I I developed this before huh. I went into graduate school. But when I would I if you have to fight to survive in yeah. electrophysiology, you you spend all your time learning all of the latest technology, the latest statistical yeah. tricks and so on. And you're busy doing that how do you, how can you have time for anything else and it's very difficult yeah. in order to make my shift from, from that kind of stuff to my first book it was a, a huge it took weekends evenings everything yeah yeah because i had i had a lab i had students that of course I'm oh wow so you had to you were running parallel lives you had a doppelganger right. you had the well, evil I, theoretician and the uh <laughs> or something like that and when i came up with this thing these people were totally stunned because my colleagues in the department, they didn't know about any of this. And yeah. of course, uh, later on, it took over, you know, because it yeah. was quite successful and it took over yeah. my life. It, it changed everything altogether because I was constantly getting invitations and stuff. So well, that's a happy, uh, it's a happy story. A happy <laughs> ending. Yeah, there's no necessity. You can write a book and it can sink like a stone. Yeah, <laughs> it happens yeah. all the time. It's not. Yeah, that's right. You know, I've got my. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, I I had um my I had an experience uh, with uh, some of what you're describing. I guess as an undergraduate, when I was selecting a, a place to do a PhD, I applied for all kinds of scho uh, scholarships and got them. Uh, but so McGill was on my list. So I talked to a mm -hmm. professor Schultz there. He invited me to go visit him to uh, see if we'd be a good fit. And uh, I asked him uh, the question, uh, has anybody ever um, defended a theoretical thesis at McGill? <laughs> and mm -hmm. he said, no. So I thought, okay, well, that answers my question. I'm not going to, I'm not going to spend. They, they were very, yeah, they, well, in, in fairness, one of my classmates just won a Nobel Prize in physiology and medicine. So, you know, John O'Keefe, uh, right, for his work in hippocampus, uh, he's been at University College forever, but uh, that he did all his work and his basic discovery at the Guild. He was one of the first to record a single neuron in a moving animal. That is wow. not easy, uh, right? And, a very know. technical and important. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's very important, uh, but uh, you know, somebody who's uh, something that's specialized, it's yeah. sort of like a very specialized field of microsurgery or something, you know, you, yeah. you can't have room for anything else. But on the other hand, I could say that somebody writes to something as broad as I have, it doesn't mm. have room for anything else either, you know, uh, there's, you, know, you, you make these decisions depending yeah. on what you're interested in. And yeah, and it's a test. And uh, in my case, I did not want to have <clears> to defend <throat> my methodology. So I went to Sussex to do a, um, a PhD mm -hmm. thesis uh, well, in uh, cognitive science where everybody there were 
basically theoreticians. The the empiricists were a minority. Mm-hmm. It was mostly people developing theories, and I felt quite at home. Um, although I moved up to Birmingham because my supervisor moved up there. Um, mm-hmm. So coming back to the uptake issue, I noticed that my PhD thesis on autonomous agents has been getting a lot of reads according to ResearchGate, sure. and so I think I think this may be relevant to your work in that in that your work is essentially also on autonomous agency and with a bit of uh, keywords adding see if one would publish an article with the right keywords i think that right. um your your thesis would be uh, your, your your theory would be picked up by uh people at google etc who are doing work on autonomous agents that's good but have you read the paper i wrote on free will um I, I don't think let me see i uh, know i don't think so i can't remember it but i'm very fast that at i'll send that one free will. It's the, i don't have it no, no I, i've read a lot of your papers but not that one it's it, it's it addresses a different aspect of its autonomous agency if you want um in which we call free will and um i will send that one to you because i think thank you and i'll put it in the show notes fun. Yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't have it. So, so maybe that that would, uh, with proper indexing, that would get that would get so picked up. You, I know. What are you doing out there with that that um, podcast? Is that part of a, a business that you run, or is it? Uh... So this is uh, this is an a, an initiative that uh, my growth manager suggested suggested that we do. So it's uh, formally it's going to be housed on the Cogzest, um, mm-hmm. which is where I publish. Uh, I've published and I did uh, offer services. I'm kind of a little bit like you were when you were running a lab and doing uh, a theory of consciousness in that Mm -hmm. I'm I'm pretty much divided. But uh, I have a business also called CogSci Apps. And and there's unity in my work in that the the two products that we've developed at CogSci Apps uh, deal with consciousness. The first one is uh, is an app called My Sleep Button that is based on my theory of the uh, human sleep onset control system. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and uh, the, the product there is called My Sleep Button. The other product is... You if, you, if you have pain, my wife has bro- recently broken a norm and damaged her rotator cuff and, wow. and has great difficulty sleeping because it's... So well, sleep is huge for for recovery and when there's pain um so there's we've only no... run pilot t- studies so i can't <clears throat> speak to the the if i won't speak to the effectiveness of it but uh it's that there's a do-it-yourself version of this that you can try and there's 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 a software that there's has a trial period that uh your wife could try and um uh, actually the uh sleep foundation which is perhaps the biggest website on sleep last week published uh eight tips for falling asleep and getting back mm-hmm. to sleep, one of which was our uh, technique, the the, the cog- which we call the the cognitive shuffle. Um, so mm-hmm. I can se- I'll put that in the show notes, and I'll I'll send you that that list really of uh, eight eight. Yeah, sleep is is so important. Um, I actually I mean I do research and development in sleep because it's easier to understand than the rest of the stuff that I do. <laughs> and my wife says you gotta you gotta. It's very nice if you can do something that people can readily understand. So uh, and it's 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 rewarding. We get a lot of emails from people who use the software and were able to fall asleep. Um, well, it's why yeah. don't we do another one on the fourth transition? Yes, we should because we haven't even talked about it. We That's we need to set good. the stage, the stage for it. Um, so the the to, answer, to continue to answer your question, the, the other product is called Hookmark, and it's a product mm-hmm. that um, uh, enables people to. Um, rapidly access the information that's relevant to their current tasks. So it's a cont- probably the world's first general purpose contextual information retrieval system. And I've written two papers already, uh, one mm-hmm. co-authored that connects that product with your uh, your theory because of your emphasis on uh, rapidly retrieving information. And the example, well, for instance, you of- should, in a- You should pay close attention to my illustration of of a multi-agent conversation that I just yes. heard you, because that uh, that could be useful anyway. Well, that's um, that that is key. That is like uh, yeah. that is uh, very foundational. But your theory shows up in also on the sleep side because on the sleep side, I basically argued that at sleep onset there's a unique transit unique transition 
from being normally we're in sense making mode and we do this 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 temporal integration that you talk about so i've argued mm -hmm. that that at sleep onset that the that there's a process happening that disengages that that um that temporal and uh, semantic integration and mm -hmm. that this disintegration is not merely a, a side effect of falling asleep which by the way is seen as a nine stage that's not me it's, it's a guy called hori in japan found that there's nine eg substages to falling asleep but mm -hmm. i've i've conjectured that the brain is sometimes is somehow capable through some syst meta system to detect that that this uh sense making is is kind of falling apart and that it uses that as a license to proceed one step further towards uh, n2 n2 is this the real when you're really also, asleep i i, th I think uh, some people use that as a way of waking up <laughs> you know in other words when they're falling away they automatically switch my wife can't take a nap during the day for example i i can i fall deeply yeah. asleep but Me too. Uh, she can't somehow she just wakes herself up but I, it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's tricky uh, I think we're running out of time. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. We've we've but, gone we've gone too long. Let's wrap it up. And I would love to yeah. do another one. And I think on uh, uh, on the fourth transition, and we'll set the stage for what these transitions are all about. And yeah, uh, I can also maybe turn that into a, a more formal talk at the beginning. Okay, we can give you an opportunity to talk. Make sure that we've yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So we can start with the talk, and then a, and then a Q and A kind of period. How's yeah, yeah. that? Yeah. yeah okay. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for this big chunk of time and all the coordination it took to get yeah. to uh, nice. to get to this in, this interview. Uh, we we'll all really appreciate it, including my sagging camera. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. Well, you got yeah. some exercise. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, okay. Professor Donald. Be in touch.